Gregory Saylor. He's the legislative director for the Council on American Islamic Relations. Uh, he, with more than a decade of nonprofit political communications, legislative advocacy, and media relations experience. The Philadelphia Inquirer named a Saylor maintained blog focused on the uh, reauthorization of the USA Patriot Act, a web winner. His criticism of bigoted remarks by Representative Virgil Good, Republican from Virginia help draw national media focus to the issue. Uh, I think Corey can discuss uh, how the, uh, the state and federal legislative landscape perhaps and, and how all of us can organize to meet the challenges that uh, Islamophobia is presenting today. Thank you very much. I'm going to talk a little bit about Fred Grandy and his positions uh, so that everybody in the room understands. And I want to start off with this. I am actually disappointed that Mr. Grandy didn't accept the invitation to speak today. I understand how he could feel that this might be a forum in which he was uh, not in the majority, shall we say. So I will re-extend. I am happy to debate him in any forum he chooses, as long as we agree on a moderator and a format, and as long as we agree on the fact that we are both Americans who have our nation's best interests at heart. So that's extended to him. Any time, any place, I'm happy to do it. <laughs> Mr. Grandy was recently on Fred Ga Frank Gaffney's radio show. Uh, if you don't know Frank Gaffney, I'll tell you about him in a second. Uh, but they were discussing that today's event was an attempt to suppress their free speech, as Elizabeth was pointing out earlier. And I mean, I hate to point this out again and again and again, but we've gotten to that point. Uh, we're not the government. I have no power to suppress someone's free speech. I cannot call the police and tell them to go and turn and stop an event. It just can't happen. I am, however, going to assert my free speech rights to say that you can say whatever you want to in our society, but I believe that biased speech should not be given a legitimizing platform. So when you have someone like Fred Gandhi given the platform of one of the two major political parties of our country, then you have to challenge that. You cannot allow biased speech to creep from the fringe and into the mainstream. It's unacceptable against African Americans, it's unacceptable against Catholics, it's unacceptable against Jews, it must be unacceptable against Muslims. <laughs> so I looked on Mr. Grandy's website, because I was, again, hoping he would show up, I wanted to see where the man was coming from. It took me about a minute to figure out his mindset. On his mindset, he, talk, he lists Frank Gaffney as one of those people that he associates with and who he suggests is recommended reading. Gaffney is one of the people at the core of the Islamophobia movement in the United States today. And uh, just to give you a sense of the man's thinking, uh, Gaffney is one of those who asserted that the new Missile Defense Agency logo, which has a crescent in it, is a sign of Sharia creeping into our society. Because it's a clear, one of those clear-cut acts of submission to Sharia by President Obama and his team. So, you put a crescent on anything, maybe your breakfast cereal, and that's it. The country's going down the tube, guys. He cites Daniel Pipes as another person you should read. Pipes is what I call the grandfather of Islamophobia in this country. Uh, in 2004, he wrote an article, Why the Japanese Internment Still Matters. For everybody who doesn't know, during World War II, Japanese Americans placed in internment camps, German Americans, not so much. Uh, what Gaffney wrote, I was, in, this is quoting him, I was encouraged by a just released Cornell University, opi Cornell University opinion study that finds nearly half the US population agreeing with this popular proposition. Specifically, 44% of Americans believe that government authorities should direct special attention towards Muslims either by registering their whereabouts, profiling them, monitoring their mosques, or infiltrating their organizations. So we're talking about a man who supports the internment of the Japanese, for which our government has apologized, and then also talks about registration. Very frightening man. Last guy I want to talk about just because he amuses me, uh, Grandy also refers to a report written by a man named David Yerushalmi, who works at the Center for Security Policy, which is headed by Frank Gaffney. So, very close circle here. This report that Yerushalmi wrote purports to say that most mosques around the country uh, advocate violence and are Sharia compliant. One of the criteria 
I love this, by the way. One of the criteria is that the person giving the sermon in the mosque was wearing his wristwatch on his right arm. So when you see somebody wearing their wristwatch on their right arm, that's it, folks. Be afraid. Sure, he is taking it away. <laughs> so that's where Grandy's coming from. Uh, I'll just really quickly sum up what is Sharia. It's essentially the rules by which we practice our faith. Uh, it informs marriage contracts. It informs wills. It informs when I pray. Basic, simple things like that. Uh, one of the things that they like to talk about a lot is uh, Sharia compliant finance. You hear that all the time, right? That's one of the really scary things that's held out there. I invest Sharia compliant. I'm making money while the uh, rest of the economy is going down the tank. Thank you very much. There'll be a lecture about some Sharia compliant finance afterward if you'd like to make some more money. <laughs> but the key things there, it says I don't invest in gambling. It says I don't invest in pornography. It says I don't invest in alcohol. I'm not clear how those kind of principles threaten anyone with conservative values. It sounds to me like we're pushing toward a good thing. It is a green-friendly investment. So when they say that there's this insidious thing that's sneaking into the country, and by the way, in an interview in March, Grandy said that the reason he finds Sharia so threatening is because when Muslims have to give charity, which is part of what we're compelled to do, part of that charity has to go toward jihad. I'll defer to a scholar in the room. Dr. Yang, you ever heard anything like that? <laughs> I miss those lectures. <laughs> uh, charity goes toward helping the poor. In particular, Muslims are informed to help orphans. So I don't know where he's getting his information. Well, I do know where he's getting his information, Frank that. But I want to talk to you. Okay, fine. They put forward this theory that Muslims are looking to take over the country, right? And I'll tell you, as a representative of the Council of American Islamic Relations, apparently we're at the forefront of this taking over the country. Uh, it's a cross we have to bear, that's fine by me. But I do want to talk to you a little bit about what things actually look like. So the New Jersey case was already mentioned, uh, in which a man asserted that it was his right to have sexual relations with his wife when she didn't want to. Uh, I hate to tell you this, but we opposed that ruling by the judge who said that, OK, well, it's his religious belief. We thought that was ridiculous. Uh, I happen to know that uh, no man in our faith can force a woman to do anything he wants to. And I've made sure that my daughters are taught that. I also taught, made sure my daughters know jujitsu, so that if any man ever tries to force them to do anything they don't want to do, they're going to have their elbows stuffed up. <laughs> but let's talk about it. Yeah. What you need people to want to take over a country, right? It's essentially angry people. Think about it. That's what started the American Revolution. People were upset with the way the British government was tre were treating them. So they decided to oppose it, OK? Gallup, just this year, Muslim, these are findings from Gallup. Muslim Americans are the staunchest opponents of military attacks on civilians compared with members of other major religious groups. Mormons and Muslims have the highest in integration in the country. That means there are people who actively seek to know more about other faiths. In the next five years, this is key, you know, because remember, I said people have to be mad if they want to take over a country, right? In the next five years, the majority of Muslims see their lives improving. American Muslims feel their standard of living increased between 2008 and 2011. <coughs> this is an integrated community. They're happy. They're economically well off. Why are you going to mess with something that's doing good for you, right? But OK, they, what they say is we're looking to take over the country. So let me just give you two case studies. I think I'm good for time. Or am I I'm good for time for one. That's good. Oklahoma, last year, the voters in Oklahoma passed by an overwhelming majority an amendment to their state's constitution that would make it so that judges in that state could not consider as long as law and rule. I don't have to rely on my notes anymore, so I'm going to stand up if I can. I'm not comfortable sitting just a Might have something to do with back in your dad. Uh, so Oklahoma passes this law. Two days later, the Council on American Islamic Relations, the organization I work for, uh, our executive director there files a lawsuit challenging this law, stopping it from going into effect. And 
remember, on, on the ballots that people were voting on, it actually said Islamic law is anything that comes from the Quran and the Prophet Muhammad, clearly targeting a religion. So what do we rely on in our legal arguments? Do we say, guys, this really upsets us and we're trying to find it offensive, so you guys shouldn't do this? No. Right? Our legal argument is it violates the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. So wrap your head around this. We're trying to undermine the country, according to their theory, by getting our country to enforce the law of the land that we live on. <laughs> Very shortly after, a judge ruled in our favor, put the law on hold until the case makes its way through the court system. Now those of the people in the room that are lawyers know these things take forever, but the initial ruling from the judge said that our arguments on their face seem to have seem to be valid, that if implemented, the law in Oklahoma would violate the First Amendment. So I'll turn the argument around and let me see if somebody on Mr. Grandy's side can beat it. We're at the forefront of defending the Constitution from people who are looking to undermine it because they want to protect its symbolic value by getting rid of its real protections. They want to talk about the flag, they want to talk about the Constitution, but they want to drop the principles that it was built on. Last example, Tennessee. They tried to pass a law in Tennessee this year. And this I am going to have to read, because I, just, I want to just definitely get this one. You're going to play it. Do I? Yeah. We're, we're ahead of schedule. In that case, I have another four-hour election. <laughs> <laughs> this is what the Tennessee bill said. And I'm quoting. Sharia means the set of rules, precepts, instructions, or edicts, that's lawyers talking for you to you, sorry about that, which are said to emanate directly or in indirectly from the God of Allah, interesting phrasing, or the Prophet Muhammad. So you have the guy introducing the bill saying, I wouldn't want to target peaceful Muslims. But your language in your bill, sir, says anything coming from the God of the law of the Prophet Muhammad. And then it repeats, any rule, precept, instruction, or edict arising directly from the extant rulings. Now, non-Muslims, excuse me, people of other faiths in this room are not going to follow this. I'll explain it in a second. Of any of the authoritative schools of Islamic jurisprudence, of Hanafi, Maliki, Shafi, Hanbali, Jafariya, or Salafi, as those terms are used by Sharia adherents, it is primia, prima facie, sorry, legal term, that's why I messed things up, right? Without any further evidentiary show. Now, for the Christians in the room, let me just say it this way. If I were to quote him and change the language, authoritative schools of Christian jurisprudence, such as Catholicism, Protestantism, Eastern Orthodox. That's basically what I just read off. All the major schools of Islamic thought. So what they're saying, in the, what they were saying in this bill, is that if two Muslims got together to practice Sharia, pray, and they were following one of the major schools of thought within the Islamic faith, that would be illegal if this law was passed. That's the kind of thinking that originates from Mr. Grandy's camp. Now, there was pushback in Tennessee, and the bill did not go through with that language. So again, I would ask you to think about it. Who is it that is looking to preserve the law of the land and uphold the Constitution? And who is it that is trying to erode its protections from a law? <coughs> Since I have time, I'll finish on this one. I believe that it is a Muslim's duty stand up and be very loud in pushing back against this movement. Why? Because we benefit from groups in the past who were targeted the same way we are targeted now. The people of the Jewish faith have been I mean, nastiness directed at them. Catholics, we've already talked about. Mormons still going through it. African Americans, Japanese put in camps. On and on and on. All of them pushed back. Right? And we have the freedoms we have today because of their work. So if we do not push back and stand up and refuse to be silent, then the group that gets targeted tomorrow will suffer because we didn't do our job. So that said, I want to thank you all very much for coming out today. As 
Shahid said, uh, we can show up and give great speeches, and if there's nobody in the room, uh, it's kind of pointless. So we are completely indebted to you, because at the end of the day, we do this for a living, you do this because you